sure sign of Allied offensive action in the coming year is the rising tide of shipping massed along the seaboard of North America. Out over two oceans beam the great American troop convoy. Their cargo, fighting men by the hundred thousand, the manpower of the Western Hemisphere moving to new battle stations, eastward to Ireland, Britain, and North Africa, westward over the Pacific to Australia, to a whole network of island bases controlling the sea lanes vital to Nippon's path of conquest. Now, rising swiftly to public notice, is America's northern front in the Pacific War against Japan. The rugged, empty coasts of Canada and Alaska curving north and west to the Aleutian Island chain. Today, along this rocky western coast, Canada and the United States have woven a network of fortifications facing across the narrowing ocean to Japan. Screened by rocks and driftwood, observation points along the coast are linked by radio to artillery stations from which the mobile batteries can speed to any threatened sector. Canadian patrol ships scout the wooded shoreline between Puget Sound and the Alaska Panhandle. And roaring overhead to Alaskan bases, big patrol bombers watch the tangled islands and fjords below. Heeding the experts' warning that West Coast war industry is not beyond the range of direct Japanese attacks, coast cities from San Diego to Vancouver mobilize their civilian defenses against the threat of hit-and-run raids. In the Northwest forest, you suddenly enter secret, guarded military zones. You find steel-helmeted fire rangers scouting the lonely mountainsides for enemy parachutists, for fires sown in the big timber by incendiary raider planes. Today, the weapons of the West Coast high rigger are no longer the belt axe and the saw. Instead, armed with binoculars and tommy guns, he keeps his vigil on the new mist-veiled front of the North Pacific. men for operation far across the Pacific, Japan some ten years ago borrowed Mickey instructors from Europe. And now, as these authentic records show, not only her army, but the landing forces of her navy as well, are fully equipped for fighting in subarctic climates, where snow may cover the ground for six months in the year. For if Japan's high command is to strike out with any strength at the Western Hemisphere, they must seize and hold the vital land arts of the North Pacific the Aleutian Islands, Alaska, and the western shores of Canada. And to guard against invasion tactics such as these is the joint responsibility of Canada and the United States. Secure behind the rampart of the Rocky Mountains, on the vast western plains, the growing North American armies learn two basic principles of Pacific strategy. First, to defend their own shores. Second, to strike out from them across the ocean at the heart of enemy territory. In the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, soldiers learn to work in the rugged, trackless country of the Northwest, the same kind of country on which the Jap would land if his attacking forces should storm the New World itself. They learn, like all America's new soldiers, the craft of bush warfare. They are trained and toughened to cover rough ground, to sneak forward in enemy positions, swiftly and unseen. 
They learn the tricks of close combat in Japanese judo to throw an armed man and bayonet him with his own rifle. They learn the speed, toughness, and initiative that today's war everywhere demands of fighting men. Above all, to know and use rough country wherever they will have to fight so that forest, river, and rock will serve, not hinder, the tactics of the army in the field. effective firepower of rifles and tommy guns against low-flying planes which might operate from carriers at sea, seeking to blast and destroy armored columns on the move. Meanwhile, America has been looking farther north to the towering mountains of Alaska, strategic pivot of the whole Pacific area. To pierce a roadway to Alaska, as Governor Ernest Grinning had long urged, through the trackless mountain valleys of the Canadian Northwest, the U.S. Army adopted plans worked out in pre-war years by a joint international commission. Their plan called for a military highway linking the far-off Alaskan outposts with the supply bases of America's West Coast. The new route would follow a chain of military air bases carved out of the northern bush by the government of Canada. Long runways gassed the green timber where new Canadian airfields and stations linked the central prairies with U.S. bases already established in Alaskan territory. From Edmonton on the western ferries, through the frontier towns of the Peace River country, U.S. Army engineers in March of 1942 led a mighty caravan of men and supplies Greatest concentration of road building machinery in history flogged through the gray gumbo mud of the peace. Leaving the last ferry roads and wagon trails behind, pushing north towards the Yukon, the caravan rushed to complete before spring its first flap of 300 miles over frozen lakes and muskeg. While the frozen muskeg was still firm, a sudden, urgent need for direct reinforcement to the northern outpost struck sharply home. For then it was that Jap bombers, droning eastward from unknown bases, struck savagely at Dutch Harbor. now to North America was the vital importance of its northwest sector, for the Japanese had not only bombed Dutch Harbor, their troops were now entrenched on the uttermost Aleutian Islands, Atu and Kiska, a foothold menacing the continent itself. With the threatened attack now a stark reality, Mock invasion forces tested the shore defense along the flank of the new highway pushing toward Alaska. Assault teams representing enemy landing forces reached in across the beaches using the actual tactics of the Japanese in Malaya and the Indies. Fast moving amphibian tanks pouring swiftly inland from the coast. For in this rugged coastal region of rock and forest, the same ant-like infiltration of the enemy might be expected. And to meet it, the defenders used the methods of the woodsman and the hunter. Stealthy, stalking warfare of those who know, once they have fired, they have revealed themselves. They slither forward from tree to tree to drive unseen wedges between the enemy's formation. It's possible to surround him while he is still advancing. Then panic and confusion spread by concentrated machine gun fire, grenades, even falling trees. Last, the kill with cold steel. And oh, 
all the while, far inland, through great tracts of unmapped country, U.S. Army engineers are driving northward. Close behind them, stout bulldozers brush the forest aside, cleaving a roadway mile by steady mile. And the rank and file of the U.S. Army, Negroes from Harlem, boys from the Deep South, boys from Maine to California, keep the surveyors on the run. They cut into the sides of cliffs. They lay corduroy, sometimes 15 feet deep, over the muskeg through perpetual ice and moss. They fight the heat of the cold and the black flies that drop on a man's skin like a red-hot coal and raise a wealth the size of a silver dollar. They work as they have never worked before. The days bring no recreation, nothing but work and sleep and food and the endless forest. Their camps spring up in the bush, mushroom tent towns with sawmills and outdoor machine shops. But always the men move on, making time, fighting to finish the road, the vital avenue of supply and advance for ultimate attack across the Pacific. beyond the bulge of the equator, 3,000 miles southward across the ocean, the U.S. Navy is clearing a path in the Pacific for offensive action to come. Already the naval victories of Midway in the Coral Sea had made secure for the United Nations a web of vital communication lines all through the Pacific. And the Japs wrecked and smoking ships warned him what it would cost to hold his far-flung island conquest. Now in the jungles of New Guinea and the Solomons, American forces flashed the enemy in a grim strategy of holding and exhausting Japanese shock troops. In August of 1942, U.S. Marines seized Tulagi in Guadalcanal airfield, and from these bases, Americans and Australians bored deep into the matted jungle to rip out the Jap-held positions. In this stealthy, uncanny warfare, deep in swamps, Allied forces sought to draw out and destroy fresh Jap reserves, and so bleed the invader of all his power of attack. Hidden in the jungle growth were Jap snipers, swift, agile, skilled in camouflage. But Allied bombers blasted their positions, and Allied troops coolly, relentlessly, inched forward to smash their strong points. The enemy died hard, fighting, battering with futile, furious assaults to retake the beachheads, and lost, with his mounting casualties, the momentum of his first offensive. And as summer ended in the shining mountains of the north, the great highway drew closer through fogless inland valleys towards Alaska. And every new mile finished, like every victory in the South Pacific Islands, brought closer the promise of encircling attack against Japan. Cold weather puts snap in a man's work, gives him a mighty appetite, but it threatens the steady progress of road building. Ice-clogged wheels, engines and treads at 40 degrees below zero need drastic treatment to keep them free and rolling. Repair crews build fires under the frozen cats and feed the flames with oil. Nothing can stop these men who know that the road they drive through the frozen shallows is now a foundation for offensive strategy against the islands of Japan. And far out in the Pacific, Halfway down the Aleutian train, halfway to Asia, new U.S. troops swarm the shore on the bleak Andreanoff Island. For the 
coming offensive, long and bitter as it must be, meant not only naval battles and jungle fighting in the south, but landing men and arms on the windswept rocky islands of the North Pacific, drawing a relentless, tightening circle closer round the enemy. From these new island air bases, fighter planes can roar into combat, and the big bombers have thundered westward to break the Japanese grip on Kiska at the extreme tip of the Aleutian chain. For once the U.S. Air Forces have wrenched the outer island free from the invader, they hold a dagger at close quarters, pointing at the very heart of Nippon. And to the Japanese islands in 1943 comes the realization that just such routes as the one across the North Pacific are swiftly opening their home shores to heavy raids and even to airborne invasions. Believing her cities to be permanently safe behind the vast barrier of the Pacific, Japan in peacetime concentrated the most vital of her industries along a short 20-mile stretch of coast between Tokyo and Yokohama so rendering herself highly vulnerable to air attack. For once destroy this jumbled maze of factories, and Nippon, as a fighting power, is well nigh finished. Anxious and waiting, Japan may well dread the New Year's promise of President Roosevelt. The period of our defensive in the Pacific is drawing to a close. Last year, we stopped the Japanese. This year, we intend to advance An early sign of the advance was the opening of the Great Alaska Road, five months ahead of schedule, in November of 1942. Over the Army's road moved the first supply columns from the south, feeding the new air bases, joining interior Alaska to the state, looking out across the Bering Sea to Asia. And today, students of Pacific strategy see in this highway not only the means of swiftly reinforcing America's northern bases against attack, they see it as a jumping off place for a great military supply route served jointly by ground and air transport, a route across Siberia to the war fronts of Russia and China, a northern pincer pressing on Japan, a road to Tokyo itself. So in 1943, with the tide already turning, the United States and her allies in the Pacific massed their strength for the great offensive. Out of the shadow of defeat a year ago, her advance forces have already fought the enemy back from the limit of his furthest conquest. And now, with the bandit strength of comrades in arms, the United Nations of the Pacific, East and West alike, will join their massive forces and take the road to Tokyo.